Welcome to the Fit Strong Women Over 50 podcast, episode number 95. I'm Chris. Thank you for joining us today. And I'm Jill. Chris and I are the founders of the Becoming LA Community. The Becoming LA Community is for women over 50 who are interested in being fit, strong, and healthy. We named our group Becoming LA because Ellie was the Norse goddess of aging who beat Thor in a wrestling match. We thought, hey, we want to be like Ellie. You can find out more about the Becoming LA Community and sign up for our newsletter at our website, becomingelly.com. And Ellie is spelled E-L-L-I. Chris, I was describing our podcast to someone the other day. and I said we talked to a variety of experts about fitness, health, and nutrition. And we also talked to women who are doing incredible things. I think today's guest falls into that last category. Oh, yes. Tracy Lynn Martin is incredible. She's one of the most inspiring guests we've had. She's amazing. I know our listeners are going to love hearing what she has to say. Let's go to the podcast. Ultra kayaker Tracy Lynn Martin is a Guinness World Record holder as the fastest solo female to kayak the entire Mississippi River at 55 days, 8 hours, and 17 minutes. The previous fastest time for a solo female was 61 days. Wow. Besides conquering the Mississippi River, Tracy Lynn has circumnavigated Lake Huron, Lake Superior, and Lake Michigan, the three largest lakes in North America, over 3,000 miles paddled. Tracy Lynn, a 54-year-old nurse from Kansas City, Missouri, has a medical diagnosis of rheumatoid autoimmune disease, commonly known as rheumatoid arthritis. She wants to inspire other people with chronic health conditions to know that their life is precious and valuable and they can still find the strength to get up and do the things that they love. Welcome, Tracy. It's a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much for inviting me here. It's really great to be here. Yeah, we're really, really thrilled that you're with us. And by the way, congratulations on your Guinness World Record. And what was that like kayaking the entire Mississippi River? How long is the river? Where did you sleep? What's the most challenging? You know, tell us all about it. It was the river was absolutely beautiful. You know, I paddled a lot of different rivers in my lifetime. And I was truly blown away and amazed by the beauty of the Mississippi River. The amount of wildlife was just stunning. Um, You know, when I paddled the Great Lakes, you saw some wildlife. But on the Mississippi River, it was just teeming full of wildlife. I saw porcupines and foxes and just tons and tons of deer, otters and beavers and just tons of birds, swans, ducks, uh, pelicans. I mean, just the amount of wildlife that I saw every day. Oh, turtles. There were just an amazing amount of turtles, small turtles hanging on to the grass that you'd paddle by, big, huge turtles sunning on rocks. It was just phenomenal. And I had wished that, you know, I was trying to do a speed record, so I just had to keep paddling. Um, But I really wish that I could, one day I plan on going back with a really nice camera and just soaking up the wildlife and just, you know, photographing it and just enjoying the, the beauty. So that was the first thing that amazed me was the amount of wildlife. But the river itself is beautiful. How long is it really? How how many miles? I mean, most people think that it's like 2,300 miles. I was trying to think of the exact number of miles that I paddled. So it's most people say it's like 2,300 miles, but I think I paddled like 2,313 to be exact. You know, there's different arms that you can go down. There's different routes. But if you stay on the main channel, and it depends on if you stay right in the middle or if you're, you know, going along the curves and stuff. So there's a little bit of variation but yeah 2,300 miles wow what time of year did you do that so I started in May so May June and then I finished in July July 11th that's amazing so so how did you find a place to sleep each night did you camp or did you have so I had hatches in my kayak and so there are times that I did camp I would just pull off and uh, set up my tent I had a little solo tent 
and supplies. But then I also had a support driver because when you're trying to do a speed record, it's really important to be able to just get up and go. So you really have to have a support driver that is following you and providing you with your water, your um, supplies, your food. And sometimes, you know, it's just nice to have a warm place to sleep at. So we were pulling a camper trailer and I'm doing the places where it was reasonable, like boat ramps or small towns where I could pull off for the day, I would sleep in the trailer. But then um, when it wasn't reasonable to do that or some of the, the remote areas, then I would just pull off on sandy beaches and camp and sleep. Wow. Wow. And, and then I assume since you were trying to go for speed, you probably also weren't taking long, leisurely <laughs> sleep. <laughs> you probably weren't sleeping for, I, I would imagine you were like, all right, get, go to sleep, get up. Right. Yeah, to do it in 55 days. Wow. Right. I was out there for 55 days. So, you know, in the beginning, it was just like, go, 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 go. But then you sort of get into a rhythm with your body. And I was trying to get, um, you know, between six and seven hours of sleep at night because you just can't do that for such a long stretch of time and not get some sleep. Right. Yeah. You know, and the other thing, too, with the Mississippi River, you have to carry your own water. Uh, You really shouldn't be filtering that water just because it's all of the mud and and everything. And then you get the runoff, some of the pollution from the toxins from like the farming. So some of the heavy metals, you really can't filter that out. Whereas when I did the Great Lakes, I was more self-sufficient because I had a water filter system. So I would, I was drinking the water right out of the Great Lakes, just filtering it. So I just carried like one bottle of water with me because I could, I had, tons of water on the Mississippi river. I had to carry a lot more water with me, which really weighed me down a lot. And then having the support driver, I had to meet up with the support driver every day, even on the nights that I would camp, uh, I'd get up the next day, I'd start paddling and then I'd meet up with him and resupply. So when I did the great lakes, there would be times that I would not see another human being for like eight, nine, 10 days. And I was totally self-sufficient. But on the Mississippi River, I saw my support driver every single day. Wow. There's a lot of challenges to that. Like at night, uh, what was the most challenging part? Just the fatigue of continuing to go with my body with the rheumatoid arthritis that I struggle with. You know, at the beginning, I was strong. I was just like, let's go, let's go, let's go. But then, you know, after a while, it was starting to take a toll on my hands, just my body in general. So that that was that was something that I struggled yeah. with. But, you know, I just pushed through it. Yeah. There was one day when I went over some rocks. There's some um, small rapids on the Mississippi River. Usually people just go right over them. But my boat that I was using is a racing boat. It's called a surf ski And it's really fragile. And I went over these rocks and I didn't realize that I knocked a hole in the bottom of my boat. So it was filling up with water. Oh, no. But I had bulkheads. I had three bulkheads. So it didn't sink on me. I just realized, you know, to me, it's just like, God, this boat is getting so heavy. It's just I thought I was getting tired. But you had a compartment full of water. Yes, I had a compartment full of water I was hauling with me. So when I met up with my support driver, And I I was just like, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I just need to stop for the day because I'm exhausted. I'm not hardly moving the boat. I was just barely going the speed of the current. And I'm just like, I I don't know what's wrong. And then when we tried to lift the boat out of the water, it was just like we couldn't hardly lift it up out of the water. It'd be like a rock. Yeah. So then I was off the water for a day, patching that up. and But it only kept me off the water for a day. Wow. That's amazing. And then there was another time that I was out paddling and I got stung by an insect. Some type of insect stung me on my eye and my eye swelled shut. Oh, no. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Yeah. There's quite a few pictures out there of it. Um, <laughs> so um, I got stung like, I don't know, a couple hours before nightfall. It was one of the times that I was camping overnight. And so I, when I landed on a sand island to set up my tent. My face was throbbing and I knew I'd got stung. And I I just took a couple of Tylenol and crawled into my sleeping bag in my tent and went to sleep. It was about 7 p.m. at that point. I woke up at one o'clock in the morning with my face just on fire and throbbing and I felt nauseated and I felt really sick. And I turned on my, my light that I had in the tent 
and got my cell phone and turned it on to, uh, you know, picture and turn it around so I could see what was going on with my face. And then my entire eye was swollen shut and my entire face was swollen and the swelling was going up into my scalp. Very scary. So I contacted my support driver and I said, yeah, I, I was, I was really concerned. But I contacted my support driver and I sent him a text and I said, I don't know if you're still up, but there's a problem. (laughs) And he texted me right back. He said he was up looking at maps of the river. And I said, I I sent him a, a, I took a picture of it and I texted him the picture. And I'm like, we've got a problem. He was like, oh my God, we've got to get to you now. I said, there's, there's no way, there's no way you can get to me now. I said, I'll, you know, I'll, I'm, I'm just going to suck it up. And in the morning, I'll just paddle to the next town. And that's what I did. But I had also contacted my sister who um, works in the medical field. And um, she, she was great. She immediately found the next town that I was going to pull off at. She called around to some doctor's offices. She got me right. She got an appointment for me into a doctor and then a local lady. She, you know, she came out. So I pulled into the boat ramp. She came out, she took me to the doctor they got me, they um, diagnosed me with cellulitis and wow. put me on heavy duty antibiotics. Well, originally they want, they said, you need to go to the emergency room. This needs to get, cause the stinger was still in, in, in my eyelid. And they said, you, you need to go to the emergency room. They need to surgically remove that. Uh, they, they said, it's just going to be a small incision. And I said, there's no way that I can paddle on the Mississippi river with an incision. It will get so infected with this dirty water. And I said, Can't we? I said, you know, sometimes people get splinters in their finger and it swells up. You just take some antibiotics and your body walls it off and and you go on with life. And I said, can't can't we just take some antibiotics and just see what happens? So begrudgingly, (laughs) I had a phone conference with me, my sister, and then the doctor was right there. My sister was was on the on the conference like uh, like this this meeting. So we all came to the to the um, promise that they would start me off with heavy antibiotics, and if it didn't get better or if it got worse, I'd immediately go to the emergency room. So, but the antibiotic, antibiotics helped and did the job. That's and, good. Yeah, and then I think two or three days later, the swelling went down enough that my support driver. Uh, who's also my significant other, he was able to get some tweezers and pulled the stinger out of my eye, (laughs) out of my eyelid. So, and then, then it got, then it was fine. Man, that's quite a challenge. But yeah, so I paddled that day. I woke up, was on a sand island, packed up my stuff with one eye, paddled with one eye and got to the next town. So it was like one or two in the afternoon. And then the next day I was right back out on the water. I never even took a day off for it. Wow. So I was paddling for two days with only one eye. <laughs> That's amazing. But, you know, you do what you have when you have a goal in mind and it's important to you, you do, you know, you do what you're what you need to do. Like if I was paddling the Mississippi River just for fun, I would have taken time off. But, you know, I had this goal of setting this new speed record. So you just you just keep trudging forward. You just keep doing it. Yeah. I assume you had a plan of how many hours you were going to try and paddle each day. Oh, yeah. And that plan went right out the window pretty quickly. Okay. Yeah, the plan had been that I was going to be paddling 16 to 18 hours a day. Oh. You know, I was going to just paddle, 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 and then um, pull off and, and immediately crash. Like if, if my support driver was there at the trailer, immediately just lay down, sleep, get up, jump right back in my boat and keep going. And that lasted like maybe two days. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> then it yeah. gets really real. But I was averaging 12 and 13 hours in my boat is what I was averaging. Um, Some days it wasn't that much. Uh, Sometimes the weather was really bad um, and I would get out and I'd only do 10, 12, 20 miles. And then I'd be like, you know, I'm fighting a strong headwind. I'm just tearing my body up. My body's already feeling the strain from the rheumatoid arthritis. I'm already starting to hurt. Sometimes it was just best just to call it a day and be happy with the 20 miles that I did. Uh, my longest day I think I did was, I think I did 65 miles was my longest day. Wow. wow. In our introduction for you, we said that you want people to know that they can find the strength to get up and do the things that they love. Mm-hmm. I guess my first question about that is, what do you love about kayaking? I just love being out on the water. 
to me, the water is like a safe place. It has always been my safe place. And it doesn't matter if it's a lake or if it's the ocean or if it's just a river. I just love being out in the water, even just a swimming pool and just swimming. You know, I just enjoy the water. But when you're in a kayak and you're floating on the water and you can feel the wind blowing through your hair and you can hear the birds and you can see the wildlife and just sometimes you can smell the water and it's just peaceful and it's calming and it just makes me feel good. It just it just really calms my entire soul. I mean, to me, it's there's nothing better than being out on the water unless maybe it's camping on top of a mountain. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's, that's sort of a different, both outside. <laughs> um, so you've told us about a number of things that went wrong on the Mississippi. Now, mm-hmm. when you did the Great Lakes, one, if you'd had a problem like the bug bite, you would have if you were going eight or nine days without seeing anyone, that would have been a real problem. What kind of things have gone wrong for you and besides what you've already told us? So I actually had bug bites on the Great Lakes too, twice. Well, there was, a, there was several, but two that was really bad, like the one on the Mississippi River. One was on my forehead and I swelled up and my support driver was like, you look like a Klingon. <laughs> actually on my birthday I had one that was on the side of my face and it was almost as bad as the Mississippi but it didn't it didn't get so angry infected like the one I think the Mississippi was so bad because the stinger was still on my eyelid um the one on the Great Lakes I got stung by a, a wasp like it was a really odd looking insect I call it a blue wasp I really don't know what it was but um, the entire side of my face swelled up and my eyes swelled shut. I react really strongly to insect bites. Yeah. Do you carry like an EpiPen or anything like that? Benadryl? Yeah. Yeah, Benadryl and an EpiPen. But the thing with the EpiPen is, you know, that only gives you a few minutes to get right. to the emergency room. That's not that's not a cure. That's not the, the cure, right. Right. The Benadryl is really the better, safer way to go. Yeah. The EpiPen, if I'm out in the wilderness, it, it's going to give me, you know, what, 15, 30 minutes. It's not yeah. really going to, it's not yeah. really going to. Taking that Benadryl helps a lot. Yeah, right? the Benadryl is really the better way to go. And so I always carry Benadryl with me, except for that time I was on the Mississippi on that island. <laughs> I didn't have any of that time, but. Yeah. What about food and shelter? Like, do you plan meals for every night? Your support driver cooks for you. And so you just show up and eat or do you eat in the kayak? Like, how does that go? So I have a dry bag with food in it and I try to eat nutritious foods, you know, grapes and apples and oranges and um, sandwiches. Sometimes, though, it was just a cold can of SpaghettiOs. Anything that has high carbs, bagels and peanut butter. You know, sometimes the support driver would fix some really good meals sometimes, you know, hamburgers in the trailer. It was just sort of like on the go. You know, you're just you're really focused on just go, 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 go. And sometimes nutrition takes a back seat to that. But you do try really hard. Like um, I would have a list of stuff to for him to go buy when I was out on the water, you know, and grapes was a great one. Uh, apples, oranges, because they they hold up really well in a dry bag. Yeah. Sometimes crackers can just, you know, they're not always the best. Uh, Bagels are great. I'd have, you know, three or four bagels with a small thing of peanut butter, and I'd be sitting in my boat. And and, um, the great thing about a surf ski is that it's not enclosed, it's open. So I could swing my legs around and just dangle um, with my feet in water on the side of my boat and reach into the back and get my dry bag and just be sitting there. And so I'd pull out my bagel and then my little jar of peanut butter and just dip, you know, dunk it in and just eat it right there. I would imagine you burn an awful lot of calories when you're, yeah, 65 miles on a kayak. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Yeah, you do. You really have to try to try to consume what you're burning. And it can be a challenge to be able to do that. And sometimes I think maybe that's, you know, nutrition should play a much bigger role when you're trying to do something like this. And um, I always tell myself it's going to, you know, I'm going to do really good with the nutrition. And then it usually takes a backseat to other things. Like a hole in the kayak, right? (laughs) 
My primary focus, though, was the people that I met. On the Great Lakes, I took a lot more time uh, meeting people, even but on the Mississippi River, too. People would be like, hey, can you stop by my town? We want to meet you. And even though, you know, I was trying to go, 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 go. I would, I would take the time to pull off and to meet people. There was a lot of people that would just show up and be like, hey, you know, I have rheumatoid arthritis or I have, you know, some type of chronic condition and I really admire you for what you're doing. Because my message is that no matter what condition that you have, never give up on your life. And, you know, if you struggle with chronic pain, you know, like right now I'm hurting. My hands hurt, my knees hurt. But I don't focus on that. I focus on other things because you could sit at home in your chair in your bed and hurt or you can get up and do the things that you love and you're still going to hurt but if if you're doing what you love you can focus on what you're doing and you don't and you don't hurt so bad and my message is don't give up on your life because working at the hospital as a nurse I have seen people that have just given up on their life and they're just sitting there waiting to die and I just you know it's like you're my age or you're not that much older than me. And that just, I I find that to be a just tragic. And I just want to show people by example that, you know, I'm not saying jump in a, in a kayak and go down the Mississippi river, but you know, whatever it is that you love to do, don't give up on it. That's great. Yeah. What kind of kayak did you say you use or that you did the Mississippi in? It's a stellar SR surf ski. So I did, I had a green one for the Great Lakes and I had an orange one for the Mississippi River, but it's called a Stellar SR Surf Ski. And it's a racing boat. It's a fast racing boat and it's designed for big ocean waves, really. Yeah. It is very sleek and it's very fast. So I used that for both the Great Lakes and for the Mississippi River. And I had uh, one that had, usually they don't have hatches in the back. And the one that I had had hatches in the back so I could carry gear and vent and stuff. How long is it? Um, mine was 19 feet long. Oh, so really, but that's very long. Okay. Usually the really long boats are going to be faster. Yeah. How many kayaks do you actually own? <laughs> <laughs> you might as well ask someone else how many pairs of shoes they own. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's see. So I own, I own four canoes. And I own 13 kayaks. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> That's great. A kayak for every occasion. Yeah. So like what? 17 boats total. If you count the four canoes. Yeah. Well, let's back up just a little bit because I've kayaked a couple times or well, maybe maybe five or six, seven times, but I'm very much a beginner. And for those listening, and if they're a beginner, what ki- type of equipment and paddle and kayak would you recommend for a beginner? Oh, um, you know, it just depends really on what it is that you want to do. Are you just wanting to go out on your local lake and float and just have fun? Are you wanting to do some fitness paddling and try to get in shape or stay in shape? Are you wanting to eventually try to sign up for some local kayak races? Um, Are you just wanting to go out and play with your kids? So um, if it's a, you know, if it's, if it's a small little lake and you're just wanting a couple of boats to go out and play with your kids, you know, the, and you're not going to go out in rough water, you're just going to go out on sunny days and good weather, then, you know, there's nothing wrong with the, we call them the Walmart special boats, the $200 plastic Walmart special. The only concern with those is they do not have bulkheads. So if you get into rough weather, they're going to, and they fill up with water, they're going to sink. If usually they're really hard to tip over, but if they do tip over um, and they fill up with water, they're going to sink because there's no bulkheads to keep them afloat. Um, That's what saved me on the Mississippi river. When I punched a hole in the bottom of my boat, it had bulkheads. And so you still had, you know, areas of the boat that didn't fill up with water. So my boat didn't sink. So that's the the concern with the Walmart special boats. If you're wanting to get like a sea kayak, something that has some bulkheads, usually like a plastic boat, those are going to be a little bit cheaper, usually, you know, 14 to 16 feet long. You can do a little bit more with those. Uh, The whitewater boats are a completely different class of boats. They're really short, but they're very quick. You know, you can maneuver really, really quickly with them. Usually the longer the boat, the faster it is, but the less maneuverability that you're going to have. 
And there's always exceptions. You always have these kayaking gurus out there that can do anything with a long boat. Um, but traditionally, that's going to be the case. And so, again, it really depends on what it is that you want to do and um, how many, you know, how often you think you're going to be out there doing it. If you're wanting a boat that you can load up with gear and go camp in, then you really need a sea kayak and probably a 16 or an 18 foot long sea kayak. Okay. Have you always loved the water and boating? Oh, I have. (laughs) Did you kayak a lot as a young person? No, actually, it was mostly canoeing. When I was, I don't know, when I was young, like 12, 13 years old, I guess, I had a neighborhood friend who asked me if I wanted to go on a camping trip with her and her family, a canoe trip. And I was like, yeah, up to that point, my family was usually lake people in regards to you know, one week out of the year, we'd go to the Lake of the Ozarks in our motorboat and get a cabin or get like a, a condo or something. So that so the, with her it was the first time I'd ever been exposed to actually canoeing and camping. Um, but, you know, I've always loved being outside. I've always loved there was woods back behind my parents' house. And I was always be I'd be back there for, you know, hours just playing back there in the woods. And I've always enjoyed being out in nature. But when I went on this canoe trip with her, I absolutely loved it. We were in the boat. We would play in the river. Um, we were camping in tents. And I, I went home and I told my mom and dad, I said, hey, can we do this next time? And they're like, no. <laughs> 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 yeah, no. So when I turned 18 and I got my first job and I got um, a couple of paychecks, I actually bought my first canoe. I didn't buy my first kayak until I was about 30. And it was a, it was a Walmart special kayak. And I just paddled it out at local lakes. And then I upgraded to a sea kayak. But I didn't stay in the sea kayaks very long because the way you sit in them, it would make my right leg and my right foot go numb pretty quickly. And so I had a friend of mine who paddled surf skis exclusively. And he was like, hey, you know, you should try a surf ski because you sit in it differently. And so I sat in it and I was hooked. I absolutely loved it. I could sit in a surf ski all day. Sounds like you did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so again, there's so many different boats out there and it really depends on what you want to do. Um, I've always enjoyed fitness paddling since I upgraded to the surf ski. But you know, when you're wanting to um, camp and canoe, then I, I love canoes too. Do you do kayak racing? Oh, yeah. That, yeah, I started racing. I did my first kayak race in 2008. And it was just a small local race. And I took first place in women's solo. But you know, I did, yeah, I, I did a lot of paddling up to that point, but I was hooked. And I was exclusively racing from about 2008 up to 2016 for about six years. There's a long race called the Missouri 340, which is 340 miles across the state of, of Missouri on the Missouri River. And you paddle day and night. You don't stop. And I've taken first place in that race twice in women's solo. And I took third place once in women's solo in that race. You know, you're paddling day and night. And by day two, you're hallucinating. That's a really tough race. It's a tough race. But I've done tons of kayak races. And um, I just love, you know, I love the competition of being out there. The one of the bad 2016, I was probably at the top of my game as far as being really fit and just and really winning a lot of the competitions that I signed up for. 2017 is when I took 10 months off to paddle the Great Lakes. And I started in March and I quit in December. And I was trying to paddle every single day. And that really destroyed my body. I would never regret doing it. The experiences I'll hold on to for a lifetime, but the every day. Not enough recovery, maybe. Just being out there, holding the paddle, right. You know, moving, moving your joints, holding the paddle. When I came home in December of 2017, it literally took me six months to recover, going to the doctor, going to rehab, trying to uh, get range of motion back in my hands. And I was never the same as far as being competitive. So I enjoyed the eight years that I was really competitive. I've got a lot of trophies and medals, but I'll never be competitive like that again. But you know, I don't regret it. You you just you move on. You do things that you love. And I would never give up those memories of being out on the Great Lakes for those 10 months for anything. 
I mean, how many trophies do you need on your fireplace mantle? I've got eight years worth of trophies. I don't need any more. Now it's time to move on and do other things. I was going to ask you, did you do all three lakes, Great Lakes at one time? And it sounds like you did. And it took 10 months. That's amazing. Well, my plan had been to be the first person to, because no, no man has done it either, to be the first person to circumnavigate all five Great Lakes by kayak. Um, because, you know, with all the waterways, you never, you, you can just paddle on all five of the lakes. I started on Lake Huron, paddled from Lake Huron up to uh, Mackinac, which is the, it, it connects Lake Huron to Lake Michigan paddled on to Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan was the first lake I completely circumnavigated, went back on the Lake Huron, paddled up to the St. Mary's River, took the St. Mary's River to Lake Superior, circumnavigated Lake Superior second, went back onto the St. Mary's River, took that back to Lake Huron, paddled the north shore of Lake Huron and then Georgian Bay of Lake Huron and then around Tobermory, back onto the main lake of Lake Huron, landed on the beach that I started at in March on uh, October the 15th. And I became the first person in history to circumnavigate in one year, the three largest Great Lakes of North America. I then took the um, St. Clair River down across Lake St. Clair, down to the Detroit River to Lake Erie. I, I paddled the south shore of Lake Erie, got onto Niagara River, paddled Niagara River up to the falls um, pulled off, walked my boat 13 miles around the falls. I walked because I, I was, you know, I didn't want any driving. I wanted to, to do it all on my own. So I portaged my boat the 13 miles around Niagara Falls and the rapids below Niagara Falls. Wow. Got back on Niagara Falls, paddled onto Lake Ontario, paddled around the shoreline to Toronto. And by then it was December the <sighs> 15th. The ice was moving in and I had to stop in Toronto. So I circumnavigated completely the three largest lakes, but I was able to get my boat on all five. Wow, that is something. Because the plan had to do a circle eight around um, Erie and Ontario are the two smallest. My plan had been to do like a circle eight, and I had to stop in Toronto, so I didn't finish the, the, the two smaller ones. Yeah. By December, it is really cold, really cold. I have a video of... Because in March, I was wearing three layers under my dry suit. And um, in December, the temperature was down to 18 degrees. And I was out there because, you know, the lakes are big. They're like oceans. They're, they call them inland, inland sea. You can't see the other side, right? Right. You can't see the other side. So it takes them a while to freeze up. And some of the Great Lakes, they never freeze up completely. Lake Erie sometimes will freeze completely. But most of them, they just freeze around the perimeter, but they don't freeze in the middle. So, you know, even though it was 18 degrees outside, the lake hadn't frozen yet. So I had I crammed myself into four layers with my dry suit on to try to stay warm. And I could barely walk. I could barely move. And there's a video that my support driver took of me. And it's like I had little tiny dinosaur arms in this big dry suit. And I'm like, (laughs) I'm warm, but if I fall into the lake, I'm not getting out. There's no way I can crawl back in my boat with four layers on with this dry suit. (laughs) I could barely move. But I kept trying to do it. I was trying to stay safe. I was trying to stay next to the shoreline and not go out so far. But then the ice started to move in and and it was, I had to stop. It was hard. I, I, felt really defeated because I'd been out there for so long and it had become my whole life, my whole purpose. 10 months. Yeah. To have to stop. It was hard. And then I was really sick. You know, I had pushed my body to the limit and I was really sick. Yeah. So why did you decide to take on such huge challenges of like circumventing the Great Lakes and, and beating the world record to go down the Mississippi? Okay. So that's a hard question. (laughs) <laughs> so <laughs> that's a deep question. Yeah. Um, when I was little, my my dad, my my dad, he fought in World War II. He fought in the Korean War. He traveled. He loved to travel. He had a friend that uh, drove a semi truck, and he would constantly go on trips with with his friend. And sometimes he would take my brother, but my dri- brother hated to travel, hated to do that. And I always wanted to. And he's like, "No, girls don't do that." And but I had my father's sense of adventure and he, he he would take trips and he would take my mom and and I would 
I, I always wanted to go and I always wanted to see the world. And he'd come home and talk about this place or that place or talk about the places he'd been to before he married my mom. And I used to read books like White Fang and Call of the Wild. And I read books about Spain and running with the bulls. And I always wanted to do these things. And so I got, when I graduated from high school, I was tried to join the Peace Corps. Well, they, they politely told me they just don't take anyone right out of high school. They want you to have some type of college degree, some type of skill, some, something that they can utilize. So, you know, I went to college and I got an associate's degree. And all, but my whole purpose was to join the Peace Corps and travel the world. And then I met the man that I married and we had my first daughter. And so I put all those, all those dreams aside. And my daughter was 10 when I had my son, Daniel. And then three years later, I had Noah. And my focus changed to being the best mother that I could be. And I wanted to give my kids everything. And so I put my dreams on the back burner. But you know, I was still doing things with them. I would drag them to the ocean, would camp on the ocean. I dragged them to Colorado. I I took them backpacking, took them to the mountains in New Mexico. And so I, you know, took them to the boundary waters. We went canoeing and camping in the boundary waters. So I did everything with my kids. And then the marriage ended after 16 years. And I just, you know, would do everything with my kids. Well, at this point, In 2015, my mother was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And right a couple weeks before she died, she said she'd always wanted to play the piano. She always wanted to learn to swim. And she always thought she had time. She actually bought a piano and was planning on taking lessons. It sat in her living room. She never learned to play it. And two weeks before she died, she told me if there was anything in life I ever wanted to do, to do it because you don't know how long you have left. And I think, you know, I I had gone to college, I had my nursing degree, and I always had talked about going back and getting my master's as a mental health nurse practitioner. And I think she was referring to me going back to school and getting my master's. But what I really wanted to do, what was really important to me was to be the, the explorer that I always wanted to be. I used to watch uh, Jacques Cousteau on, on Saturday mornings when I was a little girl. And I wanted to, I just, I just wanted to be out on the water and be out in nature and be like this explorer, like my father used to be. So after she passed away, I was like, you know, I'm just going to do this. So I just, I had a friend that lived around the Great Lakes and um, he had mentioned to me once that no one had ever paddled all five of the Great Lakes before. And I thought, you know what? that's going to be my, my goal. It, you know, how I've been on Lake Superior before and I paddled Lake Superior and, and, and it was the only one of the Great Lakes I'd ever paddled before I took on this huge challenge. But I just thought I could, you know, I could live out in the wild. I could paddle. I could be like one of these old time explorers in my, in my canoe and, and, and just, live off the land. And so that was my original thought process. And then I started researching it and reality set in. It's like, okay, (laughs) I need a faster boat than a canoe. And, you know, I love, so canoe or surf ski, those were my two choices because I I can't sit in a sea kayak for very long. So I went from, okay, canoeing. Okay. That's not going to be reasonable. It's going to be too slow. I, to a surf ski. So then I had to get a surf ski that had hatches and then it's like, okay, you're not going to be able to live off the land. You're not going to be able to paddle and fish and live off the land. That's ridiculous. You're going to need a support driver. You're going to need some, you know, supplies and gear. And, and it just evolved into this huge, big 10 month long expedition. And then once I did the Great Lakes, I was hooked. And it was just like, I just want to keep doing things. And then I was diagnosed with another autoimmune disease this year, actually scleroderma. And uh, it affects your connective tissue. So usually people think of scleroderma as your skin hardening and and it's hard to move, but it also uh, can affect your internal organs. And so usually if you live long enough, you know, it could be 10 years, it could be 20 years. But if you live long enough, most people with scleroderma die from respiratory arrest because their lungs just can't expand anymore. And so, you know, before I was like, you know, I'm going to do the Mississippi, Mississippi River, and then I might wait a couple of years, and I'll do the Missouri River, and then I might wait a couple of years, and I'll do the Yukon River and give my body a chance to recover. But now that I have this diagnosis of scleroderma, it's like, I don't have that 
time. I want to do as much as I can for as long as I can. So I'm just like, bam, 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 bam. I did the Mississippi River this year. I'm going to do the Missouri River next year. And I'm going to do the Yukon River in 2023. Woo! And then we'll see what comes after that. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. And, you know, I have the luxury. I know a lot of people aren't blessed with the type of job that I have as a nurse right now. You can find a job anywhere. So I quit my job in Missouri and I moved to Alaska and I immediately got a job in Alaska. I live in Anchorage now and that's going to give me time. You know, I I lived in Missouri. I know the Missouri River. I don't need to scout that out. I paddled sections of the Missouri and South Dakota. And I've paddled almost all of the Missouri River in Missouri. So what I need to scout out is the Yukon. So I've moved to Alaska. And I'm uh, on my days off, I'm, I'm basically researching the Yukon, I'm going to be scouting it out so that in 2023, I'm ready to do the Yukon River. I just, you know, I have a goal. And and nothing's going to get in my way of doing it. And I, I want to live my life the way my father lived his life. And I just want to be an explorer. And I just want to see and do as much as I can, as long as I can. That's really cool. So, you know, it's like, I think some people when they're diagnosed with a chronic condition that at some point could really be debilitating, you know, I think the natural process would be to be depressed and and be sad but I'm you know I'm not I'm like okay I've already done some really amazing things that most people have never done and I've got other goals to do and I don't have time to sit and be depressed I've got stuff I need to do and I'm going to get it done and I'm making memories that's going to last a lifetime and in the process I hope that I inspire other people to keep moving and never give up on the things that they love too great so on a more mundane level after Chris got us into all of that. I just want to know, how do you train and prepare physically for such big undertakings? Do you cross train? What do you do? So I have a membership at a gym and I work out at at the gym at Planet Fitness. Um, In Kansas City, I had a trainer and she was phenomenal. She was so great. And then I have a kayaking machine called a, it's like an erg, well, it's it's an erg, but you basically sit on it and it imitates kayaking. It's called a speed stroke. And uh, I didn't bring that with me to Alaska, but here in Alaska, I've been doing a lot of hiking and walking. They have a planet fitness here in Alaska. And it's basically you just keep moving, just keep moving. For the Mississippi River, I was doing a lot of training and a lot of paddling up to the point that I got onto the river. For the Great Lakes, there's another female kayaker, Freya Hofmeister from Germany. And I read one of her books and and she said, when you're doing a long expedition, getting up every day, getting out on the water and paddling is your training you know, once you start your expedition. So that was sort of my mindset for the Great Lakes. I didn't have the luxury on the Mississippi River to, you know, just do a few hours a day. I needed to jump, you know, get in there. So I was training really hard for the Mississippi River. But yeah, um, cross training is a good way to say a lot of weightlifting. I mean, I know you need a lot of core strength and upper body strength. I'm assuming if you're going to portage your boat 13 miles, you need lower body strength too. (laughs) Well, yeah, that, and that's usually my biggest downfall is the portaging because the rheumatoid arthritis has really affected my feet, ankles, and knees. My upper body is really strong. Um, but my lower body really um, has taken a hit with the rheumatoid arthritis. So that 13 mile walk where I pulled my boat around Niagara Falls, that was harder than some of my longest days out on the water. It just, it was, it was incredibly hard. In fact, that's, that's a really cool story in and of itself. I was pulling my boat and the Buffalo newspaper had come out and did a story about me. So people were driving by and honking their horns and shouting out, Hey, are you that Tracy Martin? (laughs) And, (laughs) And I had a group of people that drove up to walk with me. So there was like about 15 people walking with me. It was going to be a 13 mile walk. And I got, I got about 10 miles in about six miles. I was really hurting And um, by seven miles, you know, I was still walking, but there was times that I was, I was sort of crying a little bit because it was hurting so bad. My feet, my ankles and my knees, it just, it just felt like I was walking on glass. 
And people are like, do you need to stop? And I'm like, no, no, I just want to keep going. I just want to keep going. We've got to get this done. Because time time was not on my side. It was getting colder. You know, it was November now. And I knew I, 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 I knew I was behind schedule and I didn't want this walk to take me two days. So by the time that I got to about 10, um, 10 or 11 miles, I sat down on, on the side of the curb and I was, I was just, I was crying. I was like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I'm yeah. done. I can't do this anymore. It was like divine intervention. Cause about that time, this car pulled up and this guy got out and he said, are you the the woman kayaker with rheumatoid arthritis? People were sort of trying to shield me from him because I was had been sitting there crying. And I wiped the tears off and, and I stood up and I was like, yeah, I'm her. And he said, my wife has rheumatoid arthritis and she's in the car and we've driven three hours to see you. And Oh my gosh. And he oh. said, he really wants to meet you. He, and he said, can we meet you? I, he said, I know that your plan was to get back to the Niagara River at this boat ramp. And can we meet you there? And I said, okay. So he got back in his car and, and drove off. And I got up and I wiped the tears away. And I told everyone, I said, well, I guess I've got two more. I think it was two more miles to go because I have to meet this lady. She drove three hours to see me. I can't just sit here and give up. So I got up and I made it the rest of the way to where the Niagara River was at, past Niagara Falls. And they were waiting for me. And I sat in their car and talked to her for like an hour. Wow. Yeah. So the thing, you know, people will send me, (laughs) people will send me messages and they say, you inspire me. But their messages inspire me to keep going too, because it's like divine intervention. It's like, I am, I, I, I hurt so bad. My body is falling apart. I feel like, okay, I've taken on more than I can do. Maybe I should stop. And then I get a message from someone and it gives me the strength to keep going. So not only am I trying to inspire people, but when they reach out to me, they inspire me back. Yeah. Well, my next question, I feel like you just answered it. I said, you've been or I was going to ask you, you've been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. So how do you handle the pain and inflammation, especially when you're on a challenge like ultra kayaking? Like, do you take special medicine and things like that? Or you just push through? Um, so I take a medicine called Humira. It's an injection that I take um, every other week. And then I take a lot of ibuprofen. I, I have a, a prescription for 800 milligrams of ibuprofen, which is only a one tablet prescription. And I can take that up to three times a day, but that will destroy your stomach and your intestines. So then I'm on another medicine called Nexium, which protects my stomach from all the ibuprofen that I have to take. So, you know, when I'm, when I'm sitting at home and I'm not, I'm not super active, I try not to take the ibuprofen, but when I'm out like doing the Mississippi river, I was taking it three times a day to keep going. But I, I, to me, ibuprofen is just like a miracle drug. It really, really helps me a lot. And then when I have a really bad rheumatoid flare where I wake up and I can't move, like it literally feels like, it feels like you fell into a tub of glass and your whole body feels like it's just on fire and there's just glass all over your skin and into all of your joints. Um, and just to move is excruciating. I take uh, a drug called prednisone. It's an oral drug, prednisone. And I'm really lucky. Some people with rheumatoid arthritis, prednisone doesn't help them really well. But for me, it's a miracle drug. I start taking prednisone and within 48 hours, I'm, I'm fine. The pain is gone and I'm, I'm good. Now, tapering off of it, I can get some pain that comes back. I have to taper off really slowly. But, for, um, but, but just being on it for 48 hours, I, I feel really good. Yeah. So, you know, there's medications that I have to take. Um, I've tried some of the natural herbs and, and supplements, but I do have to go back and do all the pharmaceutical medications and that and keeps me going and it keeps me doing what I do. Wow. So you said you're in Alaska now and you're not kayaking, I would assume. No, I, I had to. So I had to fly in. Because with the restrictions with COVID, it wasn't reasonable to to try to drive in. Oh, yeah. Driving through Canada would have been a challenge. Yeah. Uh, well, what it would have taken me a week to drive here. So what do you do daily or weekly for your fitness and things like that? Like uh, you mentioned hiking. I've been doing a lot of hiking. 
Yeah. Yeah. There's a, a local mountain here called Flathead Mountain. I've I hiked it. My son and I hiked to a couple of glaciers. There's one glacier called Exit Glacier. We hiked to that. The apartment that I got is right next to a hiking trail. And if you get on the trail, if you're willing to walk 50 miles, it takes you right up into the mountains. Oh, wow. So, I mean, I haven't hiked that far, but um, so I basically I've just been doing a lot of walking. I recently, I went to a thrift store and found a really nice hiking backpack. So I bought that for $5. I'm really excited about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was planning on going to REI and spending $150 on a, on a really nice backpack. And I got one for five. And so I'm going to start doing some longer hikes. I want to hike up to the summit of Flathead Mountain with a solo tent and stay up there overnight and maybe try to see the Northern Lights. And then, you know, I'm thinking about, I've always had, you know, for the longest time, I've always had high-end kayaks and and high-end surf skis. But a lot of the rivers here, in fact, there's a river right beside me, uh, my window, there's this river that runs right by the apartment. I'm thinking about maybe just going up to Walmart and buying one of those $200 Walmart special boats just to sort of get into the boat and just do some little paddling here on the little river. And yeah, so actually I could probably find someone to drop me off upstream, you know, like 10 miles or so, 15 miles or so, because a little boat's not going to go very fast. And then just paddle down to where my apartment is and pull the boat out and, and walk into my, my house. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. Uh, yeah, but mostly uh, going to Planet Fitness and lifting weights and hiking are is basically what I'm doing right now. It's an amazing thing when I think about the amount of mental strength it would take to do something every day for 55 days. How did you prepare yourself mentally? And do you use like a mantra to keep yourself going? Or what, what kind of motivational tools do you have? Oh, my gosh. I'll be honest. So, you know, 98% of all the text messages and emails that I get are very positive from people. But every now and then you're going to get a text message or a message from someone who's really negative. And they're just like, you know, they're just like, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be out there doing that. Who do you think you are? You know, just really, really negative. And so when usually my, usually my thought process is I've got one more day in me. You know, I'm out there and I'm hurting and I tell myself I might quit today, but I mean, I I might quit, but not today. I might quit tomorrow, but not today. And I've always got one more day left in me. And that works almost 90% of the time. And then the times when I'm just, I'm, I'm feeling like, you know, maybe today is the day. I pull up in my head all of those emails from all of those people that told me that I can't do it. And that gets me up and that gets me to do it. So all of the negative fancies out there that feel like they're telling me I need to stop, they actually are, I'm actually using that energy to keep going. Okay. (laughs) Good for you. You're showing them. (laughs) I'm sure there's days when you're emotionally pulled in different directions. Like how do you communicate with your crew when there's a problem? And, And how about staying in touch with your friends and family? So I use Facebook as my social media platform. And so I do a lot of updates on Facebook and I can stay in touch with people on Facebook. So on within the first week of doing the Great Lakes in 2017 and being out in the cold, I had one cell phone and the battery died for whatever reason. Uh, I think just being out in the cold, it sucked the, the power out really fast. And I was using it a lot. That taught me never to go out on an expedition with just one cell phone. I have three cell phones. I keep uh, one on me at all times in a dry bag and it's turned on. And I have two turned off and a dry bag on my boat that I can reach. So I always have a cell phone. I have apps on the cell phone that um, I can navigate by that doesn't require a cell service. It just is the satellites. I also have a spot global tracker. You can't communicate with that, but I turn it on and people can go to, and I have the link posted when I'm doing an expedition. They can go to the link and they can watch me. It's like a little dot going down the river. So people can see where I'm at all the time. And then I also, and then for my Mississippi river trip, 
for the Great Lakes, I just had the spot. For the Mississippi River, I bought a Garmin inReach. So I had a spot on my boat and I had the Garmin inReach with me too. And that I can actually use to text ground crew. So I had a link to both spot and to Garmin. Um, and they're both GPS uh, systems. And so at any point, if I thought that I was in trouble or if I needed help, they have an SOS button and you can hit the SOS button and it gets help out to you. So um, did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, it sure did. That's exactly what I was wondering. Technology is amazing and it yeah. really allows for, so we, we complain a lot about technology, but in many ways it's free yeah. because it allows you to do things that would be hard. It would be harder to do it without the technology. Right. For sure. Yeah. So switching gears, I'm thinking about food and, mm-hmm. um, you know, when you're doing these amazing challenges, you're burning a whole lot of calories and then you come home and you're home and you change your food habits all around again. I'm sure you're not mm-hmm. eating, you know, three bagels sitting down with <laughs> yeah, butter, but how do you eat when you're on the challenge versus when you're at home? You know, do you have certain? Yeah, it's totally different. When I'm at home, I have discovered there's a diet and I'm not, I'm not promoting any, any specific diets. I don't want anyone to think that I'm just telling you what works for me. Mm-hmm. There's a diet out there called the anti-inflammatory diet. And to just make it really simple, I eat fruits. All, all the fruit that I want. So I, I'm a big fruit eater. I eat tons of fruit, fruits, vegetables, and uh, fish is basically what my diet consists of. There, it's it's a gluten free diet. There's there's no bread. There's no pasta. There's no fried foods. There's no processed foods. No no lunch meat. You know, you're supposed to try to stay away from fatty meats red meat you're supposed to try to stay away from red meat you can you can have chicken but you know i i get burned out on chicken really quickly i don't tend to get burned out on fish as quickly well you're in a good place now for fish yeah yeah right. almost every day but i really enjoy like a sweet potato and and baked fish so you know i eat a lot of that so the anti-inflammatory diet really makes a huge difference um when i'm not on that diet i hurt a lot more and my baseline pain, and you know, when you're in chronic pain, you just you just hurt. You don't think anything of it unless it's really bad. But when I'm just eating a bunch of crap, my baseline pain level is probably a four to a five on a scale of zero to ten, just all the time. But when I'm on that anti-inflammatory diet, there's days that I wake up and I'm at a zero. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So for me, it really works. But when you're doing an expedition like that, you know, if I hired a nutritionist. That went with me and her, his only job was to fix me meals. I could probably stay on this anti-inflammatory diet, but it's just, it's, you know, you, you really need high calorie, high carb foods. That's fast and easy that you can just grab and go. So, whereas I never eat a bagel, I try never to eat a bagel when I'm not doing an expedition when I'm doing an expedition, those are so fast and so easy. They're filling, they're full of carbs. I dunk them in peanut butter, but it's something I would not eat. Like, you know, I would not normally eat something like that. So yeah, you know, and it's like my support driver might go and get me like, you know, chicken fingers or a hamburger. And I would consume like a lot of chicken fingers, a lot, you know, something that he could go pick it up, you know, meet me at the river, hand it to me. I could just, push off and eat it as I'm sitting in my boat. And it's, it's not super nutritious. It's really horrible for an anti-inflammatory diet, but it's fast and it's, and it's easy. And, you know, and I told myself when I did the Mississippi river, I was going to do better with my nutrition. And that's what I meant. I wanted to stick more closely to this anti-inflammatory diet and it went out the window within the first week. It's pretty hard to eat vegetables and fish on a kayak well I mean you could I mean I did I I had my little Ziploc bags that were in a dry bag and I had my grapes I had my carrot sticks you know I had my apple and my orange but you need more than that when you're when you're you're burning you need a lot of calories yeah if you're burning four and five thousand calories a day you can't be consuming a a, a 50 calorie apple and call it good yeah (laughs) right yeah, it's a different deal. A handful of carrots isn't going to cut it. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. So I still have to try to figure out the nutrition. I'm going to be doing the Missouri River in 2022. And it's going to be, you know, it's going to be short, like the Mississippi It's not going to be a long expedition. Um, so I'm hoping to really, and, it, and it's not going to be a speed record. So I have time to try to figure out a better nutrition because when I, my 2023 is going to be a long six month expedition. I'm calling points North because my, my website's called just around the point P O I N T E. And one of the things I used to do when I was racing and I was hurting, I'd be like, I just got to get around the next point. I just got to get around the next point. So when I did the great lakes, I came up with, the website just around the point because I figured when well, I'm out paddling the Great Lakes, I've got it. I'm, I'm going to be thinking in my head, I just got to get around the next point. I'm just going to get around the next point. So my expedition down the Yukon River is going to be called Points North, P O I N T E. And I really, really need to make sure I've got better nutrition because I, that is going to be, there's not going to be a support driver. That's oh. going to be 100% self supported because there's no roads. Um, you have to carry everything in your boat. I actually went out and bought a very specific boat for this expedition. It's called a dream catcher. It's a Verlin Kruger dream catcher. It can hold up to 500 pounds worth of food and gear. Uh, it's like a hybrid between a canoe and a kayak. It's basically a decked canoe. It's basically a canoe that has a deck over it to look sort of like a kayak. That's the boat that I'm going to be taking on my Points North expedition. And I have to carry everything with me. There's no support driver. And this is the big thing. Uh, there's not going to be any Humera. Humera is an injection that has to stay cold. And so for the Great Lakes and for the Mississippi River, it was very important that I have that trailer because it had a refrigerator. And I kept all my Humera in the refrigerator. So every two weeks, I could give myself another shot the points north is not going to have, I'm not going to have any way to keep the Humera cold. So I'm not going to be able to take it. So that is, I'm going to be living off of ibuprofen. And so um, I really, I feel like for that to be successful, I really have to look at my nutrition. I really have to stick with this anti-inflammatory diet. And there's not going to be, a you know, it's not going to be bagels. There has to be a way that I can um, continue with my anti-inflammatory diet because I don't have the backup of the Humera. Wow. That's going to be quite the challenge. It is. And it's, uh, I'm, that's what I've been working on. <laughs> okay. So if our listeners want to learn more about you and find you online, where can they follow you? So Facebook is the best way to follow me. I have a expedition Facebook page called Just Around the Point. Okay. I have a website, but I haven't updated it to include the Missouri River. Uh, I mean, the Mississippi River. It's just basically all about the Great Lakes, a lot of photos and videos and people that helped me on the Great Lakes. So if anyone's interested in, my, um, in the Great Lakes and what I did on the Great Lakes for those 10 months, I have a website called justaroundthepoint.com. And again, points, P-O-I-N-T-E. But if you want to keep up with what I'm doing in Alaska or, you know, what I'm doing day to day, uh, just around the point Facebook is the best way to do it. I had a Twitter account that I was trying to keep up, but it just, it just got to be too much. And so I've pretty much, I don't do much with the Twitter anymore. But like um, I, my son and I here in Alaska, when we hiked up to Flathead Mountain, I posted a bunch of pictures about, about that. When we hiked to the glacier, I posted pictures about that. I wanted to go into Denali National um, Park and because it's winter that it was closed off. So I found a pilot with like it was like a four person plane. Uh, a, a four-person seated plane, and we flew over Denali. So, oh, wow. I posted, yeah, I posted some pictures of that. So, we've been doing something. When I'm not working, we're out doing stuff almost every day up here. It's so beautiful up here. Yeah, real adventure. It sounds like. Yeah, yeah. You're gonna well, get to explore Alaska in the winter. <laughs> we'll, we'll make sure we put all those links in our show notes and Tracy. Lynn, you've been a very interesting, inspiring <laughs> guest. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you. 
much. I really appreciate that you guys have invited me and that you're willing to get my story out. I really appreciate that a lot. Thank you. It's just an amazing story. So thank you so much for sharing it with us. You're welcome. We'll be following you. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll, we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Wow. Tracy Lynn is absolutely amazing. Imagine kayaking around the Great Lakes for 10 months. She kayaked to Toronto in December. That's just incredible. Yes. And what she had to say about going down the Mississippi, it just sounded absolutely beautiful. But I can't imagine being in a kayak every day for 55 plus days. It's just something else. Amazing. And then have medical emergencies and all of that. that <laughs> I have to say, I was sort of worried about her already. She's talking about doing that trip <laughs> down the Yukon. And I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> I'm going to have to worry about her. <laughs> right, right. And her, her races across the Missouri. I don't know. It, it was just, it really inspired me, though. I have to say there were a lot of points where I really felt inspired and yeah. very motivated. It, it's It's a really cool feeling to see someone who has a huge goal and is pursuing it. Yeah. And doing it despite having plenty of reasons where she could say, I just can't do anything. Right. Right. Someone that has is fighting a lot of pain and, and has a, a variety of challenges. I mean, I just think of family and um, my own mental discipline as probably difficult thing to overcome, but she really goes well beyond that. Yeah. You know, I thought of Wendy Rivard while we were talking to Tracy Lynn. You remember we talked to Wendy a good while ago. I think it was like, I don't know, episode 31. Yeah. I thought about Wendy too. You know, she's someone that I think of with about working out and really working out hard, lifting and running with rheumatoid arthritis. She's, it's, it's such a hard disease and um, really inspirational. Yeah, I found myself thinking these two women should really get to know each other, but maybe they right. can at least follow each other online because <laughs> they're both exactly. doing a lot of hard physical strength. I mean, they're st strong women. I guess that's what I'm saying is they're both very strong women. Yeah, it's very inspirational. You know, I'd like to hear from our listeners. If you have any thoughts about today's episode, please share your thoughts with us. Yes, you can reach us at our website, becomingelly.com, or on any of our social media accounts. You can find us at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, and YouTube. Also, you want to be sure to join our private Facebook group where we encourage and support each other. Yeah, it's a good group. It was great talking with you today, Chris. I'm looking forward to our next episode of the Fit Strong Women Over 50 podcast. I am too. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.